What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're gonna go over 10 of the most game-changing items that make homebrewing so much easier. And to boot, none of these are particularly expensive at all. So first of all, Happy New Year, Happy 2023. I hope everybody's having a good start to the new year. So this January, I'm actually doing a dry January. So instead of doing grain to glass videos or sitting here with a beer in my hand, I'm subbing out with coffee for today. Might do a sparkling water later, something like that. In these videos, I'm gonna be taking a slightly different approach uh, and we'll be talking tips and tricks, techniques, uh, those sorts of things, as opposed to doing an actual brew. Come February, we'll be right back into the action in terms of grain to glass. But I really like doing these little kind of listicle videos because they're really easy to produce and um, they actually are pretty valuable, I think, in terms of information. So today I'm hoping to help make your brew day a little bit easier. If any of the items I'm about to talk about at some point during the video pique your interest and is something that you think you'd want for yourself, I have included links down in the description box for every single one. So starting out with item number one. Item number one is Firm Cap S. This is actually a really, really awesome little thing. Uh, Firm Cap S prevents you from having a boil over and it also cuts down on uh, massive Krausen in the fermenter. So what it is essentially is um, a type of food grade silicone. It comes in this tiny little bottle that will last you for a very long time. Uh, only takes a couple drops in the boil and you'll see that the surface tension starts to break. So I usually add this when the work temperature is somewhere between like 205 and 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, right when that hot break cap is starting to form. So add a couple drops of this in, you'll start to see it like expand out and uh, it breaks the surface tension, prevents you from having a boil over. You can walk away from your kettle as it reaches the boiling point without any fear of a boil over. And then on top of that, like I said, it will also cut down on the Krausen foam uh, that forms during fermentation. So if you're using something like a Belgian yeast or a English yeast that has crazy amount of Krausen that could come out of the fermenter and you need to use a blow off tube, this will actually reduce that as well. But it does not negatively impact head retention on the beer itself, which is pretty cool. Item number two is Yeast nutrient, uh, specifically why yeast beer nutrient. This is the yeast nutrient I've been using most recently. Um, if you're making seltzers, if you're making ciders or wines, you're gonna want a different nutrient. But why yeast beer nutrient is specifically designed for beer. It has a good amount of zinc in it. Zinc is a nutrient that yeast need that is not supplied during the mash. Uh, most nutrient that you need for brewing beer can come from the grain itself. However, not every single nutrient is provided and adding this nutrient not only helps you ensure that you're gonna have a good fermentation, but a good start to the fermentation, uh, which is half the battle in general in terms of avoiding off flavors. Once again, just like the firm cap, a little bit of this goes a long ways. It only needs about two and a half grams for the entire five gallon batch. You just add it in the last 10 minutes of the boil and it will dissolve in. On to number three. Number three is a small scale that can measure in tenths of a gram. Um, normally, I would use this scale for measuring out hops, but also measuring out like water salt additions or, you know, the aforementioned two and a half grams of yeast nutrient. Sometimes that level of precision is nice to have in brewing, especially when you're trying to measure out like say a very specific amount of hops for a very specific amount of bitterness, like a third of an ounce. Um, so I recommend using the anvil brewing scale, but it also not only measures in grams, but it also measures in ounces and pounds as well. It can handle a couple pounds of weight. So if you're adding things like sugar, for example, that's another good thing to use to measure out your additions with. That makes it a lot easier than just simply ripping open a package of hops and kind of estimating half an ounce. It's fine, like if you want to brew that way, that's totally okay, nothing wrong with that. Um, but it is nice to have that little level of precision. It has made life easier for me. Number four is cold side firings. These include Clarity Firm gelatin, biofine, and super clear. Cold side findings are ways to improve your beer's clarity. Um, so if you are trying to make a clear beer, something that's important if you're trying to maybe enter a lager into a competition or something like that. These are very useful if you want a clear beer relatively quickly. Um, and you don't want to sit around and wait for a lagering period of several weeks. Not only are they extremely affordable with the exception of Clarity Verb, but they are also extremely effective. Usually when you add these to your beer, they will eliminate chill haze within about 48 hours and you will have a pretty clear beer at 
the very beginning of the actual K, which is nice. If you're anything like me and you're very impatient waiting for your beers to condition and mature um, and you know potentially change the appearance and clarify, then these are absolutely game-changing ingredients. So if you want some more information on this topic, I actually just released a video not too long ago about how to get brilliantly clear beer every time if that's what you want to do. Um, I'm gonna link that up in the corner. Number five is a seedling heat mat. So if you are using a chest freezer hooked up to a temperature controller as a form of temperature control during the fermentation, then you're on the right track for making some great beer. It's very, very easy to get the chest freezer to cool your beer down to the right amount. But what if you're trying to heat your beer up to the right temperature? Sometimes that's a bit tougher. Natural fermentation heat will generally carry the beer up to a certain level, but um, it never is a constant heat. So if you're trying to keep your beer warm for a longer period of time, Specifically, like if you're trying to make a Saison or using Kvike yeast um, or some kind of yeast that needs to be hotter than like the mid 60s uh, Fahrenheit, then how do you heat it up in an efficient way? Some people have heating blankets or heat wraps that go around the fermenter. Some folks will use like an actual space heater um, or heating element inside of the chest freezer. But the method that I've found that is actually the easiest one so far and the least dangerous is a seedling heat mat. Um, so you can get these pretty cheap on Amazon. Again, linking one down in the description box. Just lay that down on the bottom of your chest freezer, run the cord out and hook it up to the heating side of your temperature controller and you will have hot and cold control for your fermentation. I'm easily able to get the inside of my fermentation chamber up to 90 plus degrees with this thing. It's a very low wattage element, so it doesn't really heat very fast, but there's also no danger of melting anything or starting a fire. Number six is a pH pen. So controlling the mash pH is a really important part of getting the right flavor that you want, the right drinking experience that you want out of your beer. pH meters are not cheap though, uh, especially when you're looking at the higher end two probe designs like the Milwaukee has, it's several hundred dollars. Um, and if you want a very high end pH pen, you can get one for around 75 to 100 dollars. However, getting a cheap, small pH pen is not an expensive thing. There's a number of decent examples out there on Amazon that are like 25 to 50 bucks. The main difference between the expensive and the cheap pH meters is that you can measure the wort at hot temperatures right away with the expensive pH meter and get temperature correction. Versus the cheaper pH meters, the probe might wear out faster if you're measuring it hot. So uh, using a cheaper pH meter, you wanna make sure you cool your wort sample down and look for an appropriate mash pH at that point. These are really nice to be able to dial in the mash pH for your beer with and confirm your water chemistry was correct. So for number seven, kind of on the same note as the pH, using lactic acid or phosphoric acid to correct the pH in the mash. So if you're measuring your pH and you find that more commonly it's a little too high, uh, so anywhere north of about 5.6 when measured hot, north of 5.4 when measured cold, um, then you might want to add in some acid to correct the pH and bring it down. Uh, generally, you want your mash pH to be between 5.1 and 5.4 when it's measured cold and 5.3 to 5.6 when measured hot. So both lactic and phosphoric acids will work. Uh, lactic acid is a little bit more powerful than phosphoric acid, so you need less of it to get the intended effect. So neither acid, when it's used in its proper brewing configuration, will burn you or hurt you, um, and it won't leave behind any sort of sour character unless you drop the pH further than you're supposed to. The other cool thing about lactic acid is that you can actually add it directly into a keg to sour the beer if you're trying to create a sour thing uh, without any sort of effort whatsoever. I haven't personally tried that yet, but I know there's a few folks that have used that as a way to make a, a very easy sour beer. Number eight is a wort out inline thermometer. Uh, so this is a very specific thing. When you're cooling your beer down, and especially if you have a plate chiller like I do, um, or maybe a counterflow chiller as well, where it's designed to cool your beer in one pass as it goes from the boil kettle into the fermenter, it is tough to know if you're actually getting your beer down to the right temperature. Sometimes, especially during the summer when your cooling water is a little bit warmer than you might prefer, your beer may not actually cool down to the pitching temperature that you want. 
And you may not figure that out until it's well into the fermenter and then you have to wait for it to cool down before pitching your yeast. So one of the easiest ways to avoid having that problem is to hook up an easy, cheap inline thermometer to whatever port your wort is coming out of. So typically what I will do is actually, I will recirculate the cooled wort into the kettle until I see that that wort out temperature is getting down to like 70 degrees or so, so I can pitch my yeast. That also avoids the problem of recirculating your chilled wort into your kettle and having it warm up again before it goes and chills again, and trying to bring your entire batch volume down to that lower pitching temperature. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that if you're monitoring the wort temperature out. So I'll just link the wort out inline thermometer that I've been using uh, for the last several years. It's pretty, pretty inexpensive. Number nine is on the same uh, subject is cooling your wort and just kind of controlling the path of the flow. And that is something I've recently implemented into my system and something that I really wish I had done a lot earlier. And that is adding in a couple three-way valves. So if you've ever been annoyed by taking a hose off and disconnecting it and hooking it up somewhere else and having wort spill on the floor or wasting a little bit of it, a three-way valve is a great way to avoid that problem because instead of disconnecting a hose and putting it somewhere else, you can actually just turn the valve so that you block one of the uh, paths of the wort. Uh, so usually these are like a T-junction, and if you want the wort to go up the center of the T, then you just turn the valve so that you're blocking the outbound path of the T. So I actually use two of them in my system. I've gone over this in a little bit more detail, talking about how to uh, add hops to the boil in Whirlpool uh, in a recent video. So I use two of these in my system to great effect, and I have one on the pump out and one on the wort out for my chiller. So depending on which configuration I use, I can either whirlpool bypassing the chiller, whirlpool including the chiller, or directly chill and pass to my fermenter. Um, the, it's very easy to do all this just by turning a valve. I don't have to disconnect a single hose, which saves me from spilling wort all over the place and also potentially burning myself. So very handy piece of equipment and not too expensive. So the last item is canned wort for yeast starters. If you're making yeast starters, uh, which you should be most times you're using a liquid yeast, uh, it could be a little frustrating to go through the process of using dry malt extract, boiling it, chilling it, bringing it down to a temperature where you can throw your yeast into it, um, and it takes some time. I found that over the last couple years, using canned wort for my yeast starters has been the easiest thing ever. Um, so all I have to do is crack open one or two of these cans and pour them into my flask and then cut it with some, some sanitary water uh, and then pitch my yeast in. So instead of taking a half an hour to make the starter wort out of DME and water, um, I'm actually finished and have the yeast in there in like five minutes tops. It's actually very convenient. You can find them both from Northern Brewer in terms of fast pitch, but also from Omega in terms of proper yeast starter cans. Um, they do run a bit expensive online on Amazon, so I do actually recommend checking out either Northern Brewer or More Beer to find them at a cheaper price. But I will still link the Amazon down below if you just want to go that route anyway. So once again, all of these things are linked in the description if you're curious about them. They are really game-changing things that have helped me make beer a lot easier. They make my brew days easier, they make my fermentation better, um, and they just overall make the whole home burning experience a lot less painful. So that's why I wanted to share them with you. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, please go ahead, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. But also comment down below with what are your favorite things that you use uh, to help make your brew day easier. This is certainly not an exhaustive list of the best things out there to help make things easier. So there's plenty of folks that have plenty of experience of different systems in mine that uh, might have plenty of good input. If you wanna support the channel, please pick up a t-shirt or merch or something from my merchandise store. You can get this one, many others, uh, down in the description box, you'll find that. Also, please see my Patreon. My Patreon supporters are very helpful in terms of making big upgrades to this channel. I also have channel memberships if you wanna go that way or a super thanks button if you wanna go that way. All of those things are really helpful and I appreciate them. I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. 
You can also see some more frequent content updates there as well. I also have an Amazon store where you can find a whole bunch of brewing equipment and um, again, all of the things that I discussed in this video will be on that Amazon store as well. Last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you for watching all the way to the end and I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you again soon. So until the next one, cheers.